Our first speaker will be Dave Stoney. He's uh, from Stoney Forensics in Virginia, and he'll be speaking about taxonomic identifications of traces using non-human DNA. Thank you, Amy. Uh, my T-shirt for the uh, ACE ASCII um, says on the back of it that DNA handles one molecule and we handle all the rest. So what I'm going to do is take a whole other group into the trace evidence area. So we'll leave them with the human DNA, but the 300,000 plant DNA, DNA molecules come into our side, which is what this is about. Um, the, in 2000, um, we had the opportunity to work with the Bodhi Technology Group, where they developed the techniques that I'm going to be talking about. And they had a project that ran for a couple of years, and they approached us to give the microscopical and material science aspect to characterizing the dust. And they were doing the uh, non-human DNA on that. Uh, that project wound down over a couple of years, and then we had the opportunity to actually start that up on a separate program and we worked uh, most of the rest of the decade uh, doing that. Uh, that was for investigative purposes for the federal government. So a lot of that work is stuff that's been a long time coming to where we can talk about some of it. But um, I was asked to introduce this topic and because I was going on about it at the Trace Evidence Steering Committee and they said, well, okay, <laughs> let's talk about it. So here we are. The um, main topics that I'm going to cover are these. Uh, differences from human DNA identifications and the applications that, uh, that the non-human DNA can work, an overview of the approach, and then some application examples to uh, prove them. So what we're not going to have a tutorial on DNA here, but a few of the aspects have direct relevance to what we'll be talking about. DNA molecule is illustrated there, and you have base pairs that make up the, the DNA molecule. The uh, mutations are a central element to what gives humans their individuality when you look at uh, DNA, but it's also a central part, even more so, to what allows you to have taxonomic identifications from looking at the DNA sequences. And there are a variety of different ways that mutations occur. Uh, there's mutations that result in just a, a change at one spot in the DNA molecule and others that either extend it or add little pieces or twist them around in various ways. The role of mutation and inheritance in DNA identification is that mutations arise in individuals and then those spread through populations and they can be either fixed or, or polymorphic in various levels in the taxonomic order. So you can have these occurring at a population level or a variety level or species or as a genus. So there's different types of mutations. There's ones that result in a change in the length of the DNA molecule, and there's ones that result in a change in the DNA sequence. Those latter ones are what are most important for the taxonomic identification. There's different kinds of molecular markers that seek to uh, exploit these different portions of the DNA. And the bottom one here, the DNA sequence data, is what we'll be using for the taxonomic identifications of plants. So in choosing the molecular marker, you look at what level of discrimination you'd like to get. Um, are we interested in a family, genus, or species, as we are in the work that I'll be talking about, or are we interested in something at the other end of the spectrum where you, you are interested in one species, human, for example, and you're looking for variation within that? Along with choosing a molecular marker, you need to look at what reference data are available in order to interpret your results. So traditional DNA applications, forensic, of course, has been human identification. Um, there's also human medical uh, applications. And then in the non-human area, it's the studies have primarily been because of evolutionary and developmental biology, that being the motivation. So when I look at the reference data that there are for the work that we're talking about, it's primarily from those studies, not from, for example, forensic science. You have to have data of one sort or another. The human DNA is interested in that sort of uh, the CODIS, for example, is the population data that allow you to interpret it. The, uh, all of the data that lets you interpret that is all from one species. 
and we're looking at kind of the other end of the spectrum. The non-human identification markers, depending on whether you're interested in plants or fungi or vertebrates or arthropods, there's different markers available. These are chosen primarily uh, by those who are doing molecular systematics, the taxonomic work that would be classifying the, the various uh, species of animals. So when we looked at for using a technique to exploit that data bank of results that people already have, we're kind of restricted to those that, that that data is there for. Now the plants, which are the focus for my talk, are we're talking about 300,000 different species that are estimated as opposed to one species. So it's a fundamentally different thing that we're doing than looking at human variation in one species. The available reference data are some are published and some are unpublished, but a large portion of it's in GenBank. And then if you have a particular species you're interested in, there's probably somebody out there who's studying it. But there's an important limitation. Economic or commercial health um, interests are what drive people's interest in the data that are out there. And maybe there's some very interesting thing taxonomically, but that the data that are available and that the NIH runs at GenBank are those that are been collected by academics and by people studying this sort of stuff, but it's limited, or at least it's skewed toward these other areas. So an example of the, the processing that uh, we do for this, there's a, a sequence going from DNA extraction, PCR amplification, getting a sequence, and then the interpretive steps start. We will do an inquiry into the giant data bank with this alignment tool, that's what BLAST is, and then a phylogenetic analysis, and then do your interpretation proper, what's the species that you get out of it. This can work on single elements, you can have a, a thorn or a seed. It also can work on mixtures. And in fact, if you think you're dealing with a single element, you often find you're dealing with a mixture. Um, because it doesn't take very much, of course, to, um, to cause a signal from another species to be there. If you do have a discrete seed or a a thorn is in these, the case underneath the seed here. Uh, much like you might work with a single human hair, you can wash it off, clean it, and then you have a pretty good chance of doing a direct amplification. Now this avoids a couple steps. You don't have to extract the DNA. You don't have to do PCR. If there's enough of a DNA signal there, and it's a good enough quality to it, then you can crush it up and it becomes a much cheaper and much quicker process. Not all that much quicker though. But most of the time you have a mixture, and certainly when we're looking at dust and looking at transfer evidence, uh, it is a mixture. And for the level of techniques that we were using, um, you go through this process that is a purification process, essentially it's a separation process. And it sounds complicated, it probably is complicated, but for us it means you send it to somebody else and they do it all for you and return the sequence data. So it's not all that complicated. Um, ligation means that you're gonna take your PCR product and you're going to put them inside a small bit of circular DNA. Transformation means you're going to stick that little circle inside a bacteria, and then you grow up the bacteria, and those bacteria give you pure colonies of one thing. So there's a DNA extraction protocol that you go through. It's something you can do in one little tube. There's quantification steps that are in most DNA operations, you, it's a fa fairly important step. For the traces that we're dealing with, you can almost start out saying it's very, very weak on almost all samples. So it's a step you can often uh, skip. The trace samples can be assumed to have a minimum amount of DNA in them. A PCR target, so you're going to have a, a segment of the DNA that you're going to seek to amplify. And the strategy for taxonomic identification is to locate in the DNA a region that's fairly variable, that plants as they have evolved have shown a lot of variation in that region. And then what you seek on either side are areas where they're, they're highly conserved, where they didn't change much. I mean, that gives you a handle on being able to drop the, uh, your marker down on the sides where it's highly conserved and pick up all the variable information that's between those regions. So we've got these flanking regions that have negligible variation over the whole evolution of the plants. And then you've got those ones up there that are showing you the, the regions that you really care about. So the game is to try to get 
whatever plant DNA is in your sample to get the, that uh, marker, that area of the DNA that is highly variable, and then to do the sequencing of that. So you do PCR, of course, to amplify these little pieces. Um, then you look at the products, some way or another. What are we looking for there? We've got our, our marker going in there, and if the marker is successful, there ought to be a specific length to that area. And this um, electrophoresis gel, the, the marks that you see for number two and number four are the expected number of base pairs for the marker we're using. So it's giving you a, a measure of, um, did my reaction work? Do I have anything to send through the rest of the process? So it's not telling you if it's a mixture or not. It's telling you the quality of your ability to pull out this one little specific length of DNA that has all the plant variation in it. So number two and four are fine. They look, they'll go forward. Number one is double what you see in number two and four in terms of the size. So it's whatever you've done in your reactions has caused it to, to double up on itself. And number five looks like you've got some cleaning up to do before you send that off. This is the process of taking a little circular uh, DNA plasmid and you force your little DNA that you've amplified into those plasmids. Now the reason to do that is to purify one of things. So when I take the mixture and I do the PCR on it, I'm getting segments that represent all sorts of different plants. When I stick it into one plasmid and then make a bacterial colony out of it, I get one plant out of that. So you, you do this and then this petri dish is over on the side because you, you played it out and then where the colonies grow is where you um, are then getting pure DNA and that you can do a sequence of. Uh, you can find out, you can uh, increase some efficiency in your process if you do a restriction digest on each little colony. You pull out the colonies and you um, throw in a chemical which cuts them into pieces and then it gives you a profile of the different lengths of the pieces. What does that do for you? It lets me look along that, um, that panel of, of samples going left to right and say, oh, well, the first three after my ladder on the left, well, they're the same. The next four are the same. So I'm going to spend my money to look for that one and that one. I don't need to necessarily repeat and then you know, spend the money to do all of them. Each one of those uh, co bacterial colonies then get sequenced. And we go through a, a, a process then that is to evaluate the DNA sequence variation is the first step, where you look at a sequence chromatogram like this and make sure in each little peak you're only getting one thing. So if I had a, a blue and a green showing up in one spot, I wouldn't think my data was too good. So you evaluate that. Then you do comparison with uh, the reference data that you have. So there's a basic local alignment search tool, BLAST, which is part of what the NIH has in GenBank where all the reference data for the, um, for the plant DNA that's, uh, that's been done is kept. So here might be some of the, once you get your sequence data back and make a coherent sequence across your uh, marker of interest, then um, you compare that with uh, candidates. So you, you take your sequence, you go into GenBank and you get a list of candidates like a, a fingerprint computer would give you a list of candidates. So you've got a score, and the score will represent well, how, much, how many of these uh, base pairs are lining up properly. But what you don't do is take the top candidate any more than you'd take the top candidate in a fingerprint search. That gives you your basis to start. And then you can form a hypothesis, oh, I think it's that. And then what you do is pull the closest relatives to your hit that the data bank has, and you get those alignments and then you start to do some statistics on it. So phylogenetic analysis is the next step. And there's various ways to approach it statistically, which we're not uh, going to get into that here too much. But you make these little trees. And your sample is somewhere in the tree that you make. And you can look at the neighbors that it is and how far away the neighbors are. This is a, a plot which is showing how many sequence uh, discrepancies there are between your, what you did and what the data is in, the, in GenBank. A more statistically valid way to do it is, well, that's the first step. Next step is to say, well, what's the support for that tree? So I've made the best tree I can make statistically, and then the next thing is to check whether or not the statistical support is very strong or very weak for the tree that you made. Well, what we're really looking for is, does your evidence sequence 
fit within a portion of this tree that you get a reliable hit for or that the positioning is reliable and where its nearest neighbors are all within one genus or maybe they're all the same species and that gives you your specificity of the botanical identification that you have. So the specificity then is influenced by a couple of things, the quality of the DNA, the variability among the close relatives, you can have a genus that has high variability or a genus with low, and also the available reference data. Because the only way you're getting to determine that it's specific for that taxon or that you uh, have identified is by that tree. So one of the ways you can actually get more specificity, if you really care about it, um, some area like uh, pine pollen, for instance, the you can only do so much with the microscopy, and it might be very much worth it to get to the species level. And maybe GenBank doesn't have the species data, but I can go and populate GenBank by uh, surveying the plants of interest in the region of the world that I care about, getting those sequences in the reference, and then I can do much better. So the couple case examples, um, predictive source attribution, one sample, that's the applications that we've used. Here's this dust. Where did the dust come from? And getting at that through not only microscopy and microspectroscopy, but also through this. So I'm making a distinction. We're not using it for comparison. Uh, the techniques in our hands, as we're using them, there is not, uh, I don't have confidence that we're going to see enough of the same results that uh, would allow you to compare it well. Here's some examples for non-mixture. Uh, thorn from a shoe um, type is a fungus. Couldn't get anything from the thorn out of it. A very tiny stain on a level on a, a letter that's uh, less than a millimeter. Uh, that's ma mandarin orange. Uh, red brown stain on clothing. Uh, it's got an emulsifier that's used commercially in ice cream in it, and it's got uh, chocolate in it. So it's a bit of a milkshake. A vacuum dust from a set of clothing. Here's uh, all the species of plants that came out of it. It's a it's a remarkable. Uh, tool. 36 different taxa in one, one set of clothing. Uh, ten of them, you know, these various levels of identification. Uh, some of them were attributable to food. Some of them corresponded to the types of pollen that we had, with greater specificity, mind you, than the pollen is able to do. But there were also other taxa that the pollen didn't represent. So it's, it's a complementary technique to pollen. It's not, a, it's not equivalent. The, the pollen doesn't need to have typable DNA in it. And DNA doesn't mean polyps around. It means plant tissue of some sort is around. Um, so another case that we worked on uh, for the um, Fish and Wildlife Forensics Laboratory was some tusks. We got some soil out of that. These plants and uh, some fungi were identified in the, in the uh, dust from it. And a couple of ways we've used that. Uh, one is you can have a, an estimate of the viability for that species. Where would it grow? Um, based on this taxonomic identification and based on the conditions that you can map within a continent, what areas can be excluded where that tree could not possibly survive more than a couple of years. And if it's you know, a tree that's big enough. Also, some types of trees, such as uh, this endangered species, the distribution's well known. So you can plot that out too. So those are examples of how we're using the, the data. So a couple summary points. Uh, botanical DNA is present in trace samples. It's very useful for taxonomic identification. It's not equal to pollen. They're complementary signals. They're both extremely useful, but it's not. Uh, some folks approach the problem as if, oh, I don't have to do pollen. I'll just look for the plant DNA. No. You know, of course, pollen can be years old and have no DNA in it whatsoever and still see the tree. Um, dust are much richer in extractable, useful botanical DNA than is soil. And Skip, for many years, has pointed out to us that soil and dust are completely different animals. Uh, it is very difficult to get soil to behave. To you can work for a long time trying to get DNA, plant DNA out of soil, uh, and it's uh, very difficult. Dusts are fantastic. I think that the result I showed you about the, that many. Uh, species is typical. It's not an extreme result. And the last point is the technology is changing very rapidly. The techniques that I'm describing here, where you have cloning and all this stuff, that are, are obsolete, essentially. Um, you can do them, but the methods that are available now, these next generation DNA typing, 
you essentially extract it, you get the sequences of everything all at once, and it is a heavy computational load, and out come your sequences, tens of thousands of sequences. And, uh, and there's nice ways to clean that up. Anyway, thanks to Bob Beaver, who got us involved in this Bodhi Technology Group, and to Matt Cimino, our the worker who, uh, who does this stuff for us. And um, thank you very much.